Good evening, Hearts of Oak, and thank you for joining us for a, another live stream on the 2nd, what's well, Monday, Monday the 2nd of November, and tonight we have a, a guest who's been with us. Thank you, Jay Smith, for joining us once again. It's great to be here. Thank you. Good to see you, Jay. Okay. Hi, Alan. Now, we have, we have seen a lot. Of, we, we titled this evening, France v. Islam, and we have seen uh, quite a clash obviously following the the killings in france um the the four deaths by two individuals and france taking quite a, a hardline stance on that and talking about islam or islamo fascism i think was the term by the nice mayor and the response from the uh, muslim community which has been one quite angry do you want to just Kind of set the scene as you see it, uh, what has happened, and then we'll go into the, the whys and go a little bit deeper. But do you want to just give us your thoughts on how you've seen it unfold over the last, what, 10 days or so? Me or, or, or Alan? You, no, Jay. You, Jay. Oh, me, hey, sorry, okay. We want to hear you. What about you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. I'm assuming, listen, this is this is something that doesn't surprise me. What's surprise? Well, what's going on and the reaction to the French doesn't surprise me. Uh, what you saw the, the, the what the former prime minister of Malaysia said, where this is perfectly legitimate that people can be should be killed if they are mocking the prophet. Mm. And then uh, you saw the reaction, of course, yesterday or I'm sorry, on Saturday or uh, I'm not sure it was Friday or Saturday there in Britain when they went in front of the French embassy. And that's happening right across the globe. So what's fascinating to me, though, is that France is doing something about it finally. Uh, this is the first time that I remember uh, someone actually uh, incarcerating and uh, the people who have supported that killing that happened two weeks ago of the 47-year-old. And mm. I think that's something that we're, we're surprised about. I think France has taken a much more hard tone. I'm surprised that Macron would be the one to do that because I would I didn't know his party was even took that position. And maybe that's a wake up call for the rest of you all in Europe that maybe we need to start responding the way that Macron did. Now, of course, because of that, you saw what happened in the churches uh, that those people, those three people that were killed, uh, there are going to be some bloodshed. And I you know, this is something we can discuss. And it'd be interesting to go back and forth between the three of us as to whether or not that's the right way. I, I would take. I, I t come from this position that you've got to fight fire with fire. And uh, Alan and I have been on the ladder before at Speaker's Corner. We know that uh, in the last, in 25 years that I used to go down to Speaker's Corner, this was this was a, a no-brainer. If you ever acquiesced, if you ever showed weakness on one point, they drive for that weakness and they just open up and use that as a chink in, in your armor. And I think because of that, we've got to understand who we're up against. And we've got to understand where this is coming from, where this... Uh, violence is coming from the violence by by Islam. It's not fascism. Uh, it's not Islamo fascism. A spe specific group of minority, just maybe one percent, like everybody keeps on saying. These are not just hotheads or, or or lone wolves, as they keep on wanting to talk about. These are not people that have are social misfits or people who are delinquents or on drugs. And if you talk to them, and I have, I spent 25 years working with them. I, spot, I probably know them better than anybody else because of a long time and my many years working with these radical Islam. And they, you want if you want to give whatever name you want to give it to them, this radical orthodox Islam is what I would like to say. Uh, these people, they are actually, they are, they, they know exactly where they're going. They know why they're doing and they know what their motivation is. And I don't think that's getting into the news. And that's why, unless you know who you're up against, you're not, you're going to make mistake after mistake after mistake, which Europe has done. And to a lesser extent, America has done. And I think that's why we need to, we need to start asking who are these people we're up against? What motivates them and why are they doing what they do? Could it be with, with Macron? I mean, we're, I think we're all a bit surprised. Suddenly he's taking a strong line on all sorts of things. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. I remember when, when uh, maybe a couple of months ago when our statues were being torn down by Black Lives Matter activists and the rest of it, and he made a statement. He said that the statues um, from the Republic will never be taken down, will never be torn down. Our history is our history. So yeah. That was a first that rather surprised us. But the whole thing about Islam, I mean, if you remember when the, the Bataclan massacre took place, um, he walked down the Champs Elysees arm in arm with uh, Angela Merkel and others, and it was all uh, forget forget about the past. Let's look look, look forward together. So it's relatively recent he started to take a hard line on these issues, and I wonder if, at least with regard to Islam, it's just that the the burning of churches and the slaughter of French citizens, innocent French citizens, got so bad now 
uh, that even he feels that he's got to do something. And he, because of that, he's, he's woken up ahead of um, uh, Merkel and John, Boris Johnson and all the rest of the, the people across, across Europe. He's suddenly woken up. Gosh, this really is going on here. The second point I make, just a question to you, Jay, is I, I read somewhere that um, I can't remember the name of the group, but it was clearly a, a senior Muslim group in France was so disgusted at the slaughter of, of uh, innocent French uh, citizens by, uh, so, well, as they would say, so-called Muslims, that they cancelled, they called for the cancellation of the celebration of uh, Islam's prophet Muhammad's birthday celebration, which I believe are this weekend or about now. I don't know if they achieved that or whatever, but they, 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 that was their mark of saying, this is disgusting, this is disgraceful, it's horrendous, and, and we want nothing to do with it. Yeah, I think you're going to get both voices, Alan. I think this is quite typical. And I think the, uh, and the fact that you know so much about it is this is the media immediately elevates this group. If you look and ask the fact that you've never heard about this group of voices, just right there, that it's not a well-known group. Uh, the, the, the alternative is what we tend to find in Britain. It's always the Ahmadiyya that take that line. And the Ahmadiyya are not even seen as Muslim by other Muslims. The majority of Muslims, though, support, uh, support uh, the backlash against the the cartoons and it really comes down to those cartoons uh, those mm -hmm. charlie hebdo cartoons we're talking about that's the french mm -hmm. equivalent to the danish cartoons that were done earlier in 2005 and there is the there's an enormous support uh, I, uh for anybody that shuts down or set or sets anything against those cartoons uh, and that's why we're we're getting this here in england with but in england it's all been done by one person one little girl hardy five foot two her name is hatun tosh and she is the one that's carrying that crusade in England all by herself. And she's good friends of ours. She, in fact, she's a colleague of mine. She was the one that was uh, has taken over my ministry there in the United Kingdom. We can talk about her a little later. But I think it's I think what you're thinking, what you're seeing there, Alan, is there is a they're trying to find reciprocity. They're trying to find the media is trying to find someone, some group that will uh, that they can say this is the Islamic voice. When in reality, it's a very small Islamic voice. And you can see that just by looking around the world and looking at the enormous amount of backlash uh, against those cartoons. And the fact that the, 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 the trial is on at this moment for those who, um, who killed those, uh, the, mm -hmm. the people in the office. And, and also remember that France, it's not just Macron that's doing this. There's been a, quite a bit of public support behind uh, for a supporting a, a public support against Islam and and that man that that sixteen year old who killed that forty seven year old they've been uh, they've been putting images on buildings government images of those cartoon covers yeah. in there in in France for them to put it on government buildings suggests the government is also supporting this and so you mm. can see it, there is a groundswell of anger and I think what happens they're just getting fed up. They're getting fed up because here is one group that is burning churches, as you announced, uh, Alan. That hasn't gotten to the news here in the West. In France, yes, they know about these burning churches, but have we heard about it? Have they been? Has it been front and center in our in our journalistic enterprise? Not at all. And so it's good for the French to find these, the French people to find say enough is enough. Macron, I think, is reading the the pulse of his own nation. He's reading the pulse of his of his people, and he's realizing if he doesn't say something, the far right will take this. And they'll run with it, as they have done in the past. Jay, it was interesting when I was outside the French embassy on Friday filming, and I had some people coming up to me and asking me who I was with and why I was filming. Um, but one lady came up holding a um, "We Love Muhammad" sign and said to me, "What was? Wh wh why was I filming? What did I think?" And I said, "I'm, I'm quite saddened that four French citizens had to die um, by." perpetrators who seem to use their religious faith as a reason to kill them and she was saying oh yes but we're very offended because our prophet uh, they, they've said things about him and and then I came back and said but why are you not offended that four people had to die surely you should be demonstrating in solidarity with those four people and she said Yes, yes, we're, we're very sad, but our prophet, we cannot have these things, we cannot be insulted, we can't, and she couldn't seem to grasp that the four people who lost their lives, that actually was worse than someone being offended, but I guess that's because in Islam, it's a completely different understanding than most of us would have in the West. 
Yeah. And I think you put your, your finger on it, Peter. I think this is the difficulty that a lot of us, and I'm, I'm assuming the majority of people who are watching this broadcast are Westerners who, do, who are probably asking the same question. What is it about Muslims? Where they get so incensed that they can't, they can't even think, logically think through the the ramifications of the actions of their co-religionists. How can they? How can they keep on saying but, but, but? Well, you cannot do but, but, yeah. as if that's that's even an answer. And we're sitting there kind of aghast. Why would why would she even answer that way? And I I found out, and for me the penny dropped. I think back in the nineteen or late uh, late nineteen hundreds when I was there in London, I was there working. Uh, uh, amongst the uh, there at speaker's corner and i kept on getting this type of response that was automatic it wasn't even a thought through it's just yes but you don't understand who our prophet is you don't understand how we love our prophet remember and then after then the course the danish cartoons came out and when the danish card came out those 12 cartoons by jills poland there in uh holland poland there in um, uh, uh, copenhagen when mm -hmm. that was and they had riots all over the muslim world i think 17 people lost their lives they had a huge rally for uh, for Islam there at Trafalgar Square. And I went down to the rally and uh, there was speaker after speaker denouncing these cartoons. And I just wanted to find out myself what was going on. Why were there such as in anger incense against 12 innocent cartoons? And what I kept on hearing was, you don't understand. We love our prophet more. I love my right. prophet more than I love my brother. He's closer to me than my father. He's close to my aunts and uncles. And I said, no, he's not. Hold on a minute. What's going on here? And I, I started to realize that they were speaking about Muhammad as if we were speaking about Jesus Christ. They, I mean, they were almost mimicking us. And I was hearing the same type of admiration for Muhammad that they had for Jesus Christ. And I said, OK, uh, we, we allow you to mock Jesus Christ. Uh, I, you know, I love Jesus Christ much more than you love Muhammad. Oh, no, you cannot. They're, in fact, we love they kept on responding. No, we love Jesus better than you do because you've elevated him as a God. And I kept on thinking, where is this coming from? And then I realized that that for them, for Muslims, they don't have anything like we have. They have nobody that they can go to in private who is as close to them as the juggler vein as, as we can. And, and I, suddenly I realized, I, you know, whenever I go, whenever I have a problem, whenever I ha I'm depressed or whenever I'm in crisis, who do I go to? I go to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And I know he's right there. I know he's right here. I know he's right there speaking right as we're talking. What, what does Islam have that's comparable? They have nothing like this. And what they have done, they have taken the only, really the only um, outlet that's given them, and that's the Prophet Muhammad. And it's interesting because the Prophet Muhammad is an easy one to take because he's right there alongside Allah in the Shahada. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. There's only one God, but God and Muhammad is his prophet, is the category that you get, it's their statement of faith. So by elev in some ways, they've elevated him to the very status of divinity, unlike much like they say we have done. And ironically, by doing that, they bring him down to a human level where they can relate to him almost as close as they can to their brother or to their father or to their cousin. And I realized they're doing to Muhammad what they think we have done to Jesus Christ. We haven't done anything. Jesus Christ came to earth. We didn't create that. It wasn't something that we thought up. It wasn't something that we're using as a theological, uh, as a theological bandy to, to, to bandy around. No, they have, this is something they've had to create because I think everybody wants someone. Everybody needs God like that. We do need to have God sure. next sure. to us, who's close to us. But Jay, nonetheless, I mean, you, you, you say you, you feel as passionately about Jesus as they claim to feel about Muhammad. But nonetheless, if somebody slags down Jesus, you may not like it, but you're not going to stick a knife in them. You're not going to hit them with a lump of wood. You're not going to, you may argue against them, but you're not, that's not going to give you a, a reason for it, no matter how much. So why, why is it that uh, they, they feel that they have, can use violence against those who slag down Muhammad, whereas you don't feel you can use violence or should use violence for those that, that don't like Jesus Christ? You've got to come back to these two books. You've got to come back to these two books. You're asked, what is this book? This is the biography of Muhammad. And you've got to go and see what Muhammad did when he was slagged off. And see, most, the vast majority of people who are watching have never read this book. It's very thick. I, don't, I can understand why you don't want to. But this is the biography written by Ibn Hisham. Now, they say Ibn Ishaq up here. It's not Ibn Ishaq. Don't worry about it. It's Ibn Hisham, who died in 833. This is the point by point, day by day, year by year, story of what happened when he moved to Medina while they're from Mecca actually what happened when he was born and then supposedly in 622 he moved to Medina and when he moved to Medina he got an awful lot of opposition including getting slagged off by Asma bin Marwan. Asma bin Marwan was a poetess 
and she wrote poetic verse against him, which is similar to what we see in the Danish cartoons, which is very similar to the Charlie Hebdo cartoons. That would be the equivalent in the seventh century. So she just wrote poetic verse because she was a native of Medina. Uh, she felt that this guy was this usurper that come from Mecca was somebody that didn't belong to Medina. And yet here he was putting together this treaty of Medina where he was the arbiter between man and God. And she says, who are you coming into our city and thinking that you can now run us and thinking that you are now an arbiter between a man and God? That's a perfectly legitimate criticism. And he said, who's going to take care of this woman for me? Umer, one of his disciples, went that evening to her house, according to this biography. She had six children. She was suckling her baby on her bed. He took his knife and plunged it through her heart, killing her instantly in front of her children. Came back the next morning told Muhammad what he had done, Muhammad turned to him and said, great are you for what you have done for your prophet. Now that's the example right there in the biography of Muhammad. It, it took place around 622. Look and see what he did after that, because anybody that stood against him, he either had assassinated or he had killed. 25 people that are listed there who were all killed, many of their crimes was just mocking him or disagreeing with him. Look at the entire Banu Koraiza family. The Banu Koraiza family were a Jewish family who in 627 refused to support him in his battle with the Meccans. They were, they, they were not part of that. They had not signed the Treaty of Medina. Their signatures are not on it. What did he do to those to 800 of those men who refused to support him? He took them all out after the Battle of the Trenches. This is in 627. He only had been there since 622. So he was only a, a, he'd only been living in that city for five years. And he took every one of their main 800 in groups of 10 at a time and slit their throats and have them thrown into a pit. So if this is the example of this man who they say they love, this woman who comes up to you there, uh, Peter, and says, this is the man we love, then ask him, well, have you read his biography? Have you seen what he did to Asma bint Marwa? Have you seen what he did to the Koraiza Islamic family? I'm sorry, the Koraiza Jewish family living there in Medina. In fact, by 627, there were no Jews left. They had either been thrown out of Medina or they had been imprisoned or they had been taken as concubines for his men, the wives, and the children were taken as prisoners or the men were killed. So if that, to me, that's called genocide. That's what I would call as a genocide. But how many Muslims are talking about this today? And how many politicians are reminding people if they're going to use Muhammad as their example, if he is their paradigm, if he is their model, why don't they read his biography? Look and see what he did to those who stood against him. And now you can understand possibly why when you have these cartoons that were there in Holland or you, I'm sorry, in Denmark, or you have these, um, these covers of these magazines uh, there in Charlie Hebdo, you mm -hmm. can then understand why there's this reaction. It's not that they make up. It's not that they hate these people. It's because their prophet is their model and their prophet is their paradigm. They almost don't have an option but to support Muhammad. And uh, to destroy those who stand against him, because Muhammad did this. Now, when you ask, well, did Jesus Christ do this? Uh, there's the there's the answer, because the next step is let's see what Jesus did when he was mocked. Let's see what he was did when he was. Yes. When he was uh, crucified or when he was whipped, even the one time, the one time where his disciples tried to defend him there in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew, chapter 26, verse 50, 62. Oh, I love that story, because here are the disciples. We're trying to defend him. Peter takes up a knife and cuts off the ear of one of the servants. Jesus takes the ear, put it back on, on the servant, and turns towards Peter and says, put away your sword. For he who lives by the sword that way dies by the sword that way. You are not to defend me at all with any weapons of this world. We're not to use weapons of this world. So when you look at Jesus versus Muhammad as two models, uh, we follow Jesus. He did come to earth as God. He, we, he knew that he was the model today. He is the model today in the 21st century that he was in the first century. He hasn't changed in 2000 years and he never will change. And that's why when you want to ask, which is the better man to follow, which is the, I would certainly say for God's sake, come on back to Jesus because he does tell us to put away our swords. We're not permitted to use swords in his defense. Muhammad however, not only use the sword, he demanded that they use the sword to, to defend him. So can you, why are we surprised? Why are we surprised? If this is their paradigm, then why are we surprised that Muhammad's don't say this or don't do this? Well, so, Jay, if, 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 Muhammad is, if, if Muhammad is such a, a bad uh, character and you're giving your sources there, um, Jay, one, why is it we haven't heard about it? And two, what do intelligent and sensitive Muslims uh, so like some of them, the academics you know in Oxford and Cambridge, the Muslims there, what do they say about this? I mean, are they not shocked by their own, by their own prophet <laughs> or, do they, or do they whitewash it or what do they do? I mean, you've, you've discussed and debated with them. So tell us how, how do they handle these horrendous truths about, about Muhammad? 
Alan, listen, I it's not it's not so much why haven't they done it. It's because it's there is a censorship on anything that is dysentorious, anything against the prophet. Remember, mm -hmm. in almost every Muslim country, if you criticize Muhammad or if you criticize the Quran, that's a capital offense. And, uh, and that is true. Look at the 295C law there in Pakistan to criticize Muhammad like I've just done or criticize the Quran like I always do. And Hatun is now doing. I mean, that's what she did. That's why that's her great offense is what she's doing with that Quran, drilling mm -hmm. holes in it. To do that, if she were not, if she were outside of Speaker's Corner, if she went to Pakistan, she could be she could be executed for that. Now, take that one step and come back a bit, bring it down a bit into a European Western environment. The the equivalent of that, we don't kill we don't kill people for what they say. We don't do that. Thank God we have, you know, we have the law of Judeo-Christian environment that, that supports, that we do follow. It's mm -hmm. it's more of a memory than a law. But nonetheless, we don't kill people for what they say. Not anymore. We used to, but not anymore. But to say something like I've just said here on, on internet, to say this uh, on a university campus, we could not, I could no longer say this after 2010. Remember, in the 1990s, whenever there was a debate on almost any university campus there in Britain, I was the one called to do the debates against Muslims. Why was I the only one that was doing debates against Muslims? I'm not even English. I'm a foreigner. Because I was the only one that knew how to go back to this material. I was the only one using it. I've been using this for over 30 years. And it's, to me, if you're going to talk about someone named Muhammad, you better go back to his sources. You better go back to what he said. You better go back to see what he did. And to do that, like I, I demand that of anybody who says of Jesus Christ. I say, look, and show me where he said what he said and show me what he did in the gospel of Jesus Christ. If I demand that of my own model, Jesus Christ, then I should demand that of also of Muhammad. And when I was doing that in the 1990s, Alan and Peter, I was able to I have was given free reign. After 2001, there was a totally new narrative that was brought into Britain. And it was not just Britain, it was all over the world. And that was that Islam was a religion of peace. That was the new narrative. It almost happened overnight after 9-11. Hmm. And since 2001, they are allowing you to point or to, to show Muhammad as a man of peace. Because that does not fit not only the politician's narrative, it does not fit the scholarly and the academic narrative. Because I think, I, this is my own view, and I've asked others, and they don't, they usually usually change the subject. But it seems to be both in academia and in the polit political sphere, there is a almost a desire to remodel Islam in the image of a Western religious uh, entity. They want to, that narrative and only that narrative to be voiced. And in order to bring that narrative out, you've got to shut down people like me who are saying, hold on, that's not historical. That's not the historical Muhammad that we see in the seventh century. That's not the Muhammad of the of the traditions. That's not the Muhammad of Ibn Hisham or al waqidi That's not the Muhammad of Ibn Ishaq. That's not the Muhammad of Al-Buhari, Sahih Muslim, Ibn Dawn, Al-Tabari especially. These are the, those are the traditions you need to go to to know what you're talking about. You need to go back to the Siddha, which is the biography. You need to go back to the Hadith, which are the sayings. You need to go back to the Tafsir, which are the commentaries, and the Tahrik, which are the histories. And in order to understand that Muhammad, the Muhammad of Islam, the true Muhammad, you're going to start saying things and bringing things up that is not at all politically correct. And that's why they've shut down this as, in fact, after 2010, I was known as a hate preacher and I became an Islamophobe. And that's why they just shut me down from all university uh, university debates. I, I left in 2017 after not doing a debate for seven years. I couldn't would not be able to do a debate because I they knew that I would go back to the sources. I would go right back to the Islamic sources. Now, I've never heard of anything of that stupid in my life. Just to stop and think. Historically, whenever you want to talk about someone who's a historical figure, you go back to their biography, do you not? You always go back to what they say. You go back to their original, you go back to the original. If they don't exist, then you go back to those who knew them. If that doesn't exist, then you go back to those who spoke about them. And that's why, it's interestingly, um, uh, interestingly, Alan, Islam is the only religion I know of where what you say will shut down your will shut down the debate. What you say may also kill you. Do you know of any other ism? Do you know of any other entity? Do you know of any other debate material or any any other subject where what you say will throw you out of the debate, will shut down the doors for you, and also in some cases may get you killed? Do you? This is unique to Islam. Remember, there is only one religion that has a that has a phobe behind it, Islamophobe. That only exists with Islam. There's no such thing as Hindu phobe or Christian phobe or uh, any other phobic. You can you are only a phobe if you criticize Islam. And it doesn't matter what you criticize, you become a phobe. And once you're called an Islamophobe, it shuts down that debate, it shuts down that discussion, and you're no longer be able to. You're no longer invited on campus.
Um, Jay, can I, uh, sorry, getting a, um, a number of messages. I just want to um, point out. So Atheist Steve, who is someone who's done a speaker's corner quite a bit, said incident happened Hi, in, in synagogue in Vienna. So I believe, uh, looking at it, that there's a, a gun attack um, from a number of individuals on the synagogue in Vienna, on the Jewish quarter. Um, and one of them, it seems, has tried to blow himself up. Um, so this... Uh, it, we, we don't know yet the, the details, um, but you regularly you have individuals carrying out these attacks and the phrase they use is Allah Akbar, uh, Allah is great, and that automatically links it to their religious faith. Of course, many of our, well, much of our media, many of our newspapers refuse to even mention that. They just simply say a terror attack and you have a whole article on it without actually going into why that terror attack would happen but what you're saying is that when people carry out an attack like that it is justified in islamic scriptures absolutely i mean, I mean you'd, all you need to do is open up the quran to see that i mean if you have any doubt take a look at now this is i'm sure this is not new I, hi steve I, I steve is a good friend from from speaker's corner he's been there for many years so we know him since we've gone back mm. many years but I'm, I'm i'm sad to see what i'm hearing you're saying this is going on right as we speak it's going to ride as we speak. So I've just seen a couple of videos Jack Dawkins put up. So I think it's a number of gunmen attacking the synagogue in the Jewish quarter in Vienna. So it's just happened in the last 12 minutes or so. So, yes. Okay. And, and what you always do, you go to that which is weakest. You go, always go to the weakest. And you actually go to that which is the most symbolic. That's, that's why they attack the churches. That's why you're attacking the mm -hmm. synagogue. Uh, you notice they don't go to where any there are any armed people. They don't go where there are any army or any military. Yeah. They, they always go to where people are completely unarmed, so that yeah. they can be successful. And I would suggest that the, that uh, that that this is again it comes right back to this whole notion uh, that Islam has always followed one paradigm, and for twelve for fourteen hundred years, it's followed that same paradigm. It's one that is full of violence, and it one it is one that does not surprise me is still using that. That's their default. We have a completely different default, which is to come back to the person of Jesus Christ and follow his example. So there's two, completely two contradicting, and uh, they are contradicting narratives between Jesus and, and Muhammad. What, what was your question that you followed after that? Once you sense that? No, just saying that these people often they're called mentally ill. I don't know where okay. the media is calling those who follow Islam mentally ill. I, I don't think that's what they're getting at. Uh, but they try and use um, someone's mental. Uh, abilities or inabilities as an excuse or reason why they carry that out and never link it to th their religious faith. And another uh, distinction is they talk about it being a, a political ideology. You talk about Islamism instead of an Islamic attack. Uh, so mm -hmm. actually, again, removes the, the, the attack from someone's religious faith and places it on a political ideology or in their mental state. So anything to remove it from the, the fact that it could be based in the scripture of of the Muslim. Yeah, let me just answer both those simultaneously. I, Islam, by definition, is a political entity as well as a theological. It brings the two together. And that's one of the reasons we in the West don't understand this. We separate the two. That which you give to uh, Caesar, give to Caesar. That which you give to God, give to God. Ma uh, Jesus says that in Matthew. And mm. so because we separate the two, we've done that also. Uh, we've also done that in Britain. You've done that. Well, so you've tried to do that in Britain. But certainly in the West, we do separate the two. And what? Uh, so that which belongs to Caesar is the political entity. And that they are the ones who are who are to use violence. They are the ones to have military policing and all the rest. The church is not to be a part of that. Now, the church has been historically. And that's where it's got it wrong. Islam brings the two together. And that's what happened in 624 according to this book again. Just read this book. It's all right there. When Muhammad moved to Medina, it took him two years to try to uh, bro uh, broker that relationship between the Ansar and the Mahajud, uh, I'm sorry, the Mahajud and the Banu Kainuka, the Banu Nadir and the Banu Quraysh, apparently the three major Jewish tribes. When that broke down and they no longer support him after the battle of Uhud, the, fir the first battle, he then introduced the Khilafat and the Khilafat brought the two both is the uh, political and theological together. So Islam is a political entity. That's true. And that's to say ism, it is something within a political entity is to misunderstand because mm. it is always, always founded and given authority by the script, by the scripture and by, by the man. So the book of the man, as I've always said, the book of the man always gives foundation to the political entity that's on top. It's not like this. It's like this. It's always been like that. And that's why historically, Whenever you go to battle, you yell Allahu Akbar. It's a theological act to go to battle. 
If you have any doubt, just look in the Quran. The Quran is very clear in chapter 8, verse 39. Make war, kill the unbeliever until there is no more fitna. Now, doesn't kill them until you win the battle, until there is no more disbelief. So you go to battle to make sure there's no more disbelief. So there is the political and the theological wrapped up as one. And that's in chapter 8, verse 39. Look at chapter 9, verse 29. Make war on the people of the book. Why should they make war upon us? We're people of the book. Until we pay the Jizya tax, because we are co-belligerent with them. We are people of the book along with them, but we must come underneath them, subservient to them, and that's a political act. So you can see the politics and the, uh, the theology go together. Now look at chapter 47, verse 4. Chapter 47, verse 1, 2, and 3, actually, in, uh, it talks about who a believer is and who an unbeliever is, right? So a believer versus an unbeliever. Uh, a believer is those who follow the prophet and uh, follow God and follow the prophet. An unbeliever are those who don't follow God and do not follow the prophet. Then verse 4, cut off the heads of the unbeliever. We're to, to, that's a political act. You cut mm -hmm. off their heads. And it doesn't say in any context. And then it goes on to say in verse 5 and 6 of that same chapter, and those who participate in jihad, that's a political act. Whether they should die or they should, uh, what, if they should die, they shall go straight to heaven for their reward shall be in heaven. That's the only verse in the Quran that gives you an automatic ticket to heaven. So that's a theological statement. So you can see the two are wrapped up. The Quran is full of these political and these theological statements wrapped together. You can't, you can't separate the two. And we think you can. And so that's why we as Westerners looking at say, ah, so that must be a political act. These are just politicalism. These are just nothing more than ideologies. They are ideologies that are absolutely intertwined within the Quran. They are absolutely founded and given authority by Muhammad himself, by look and see what he did. So when he, ha when he had Asma bin Marwan assassinated because all she did was poetic verse against him, that was not only a political act, that was also a theological injunction that he was demanding that be done. And so I would say the same thing when he also confronted the uh, confronted the Jews there in Medina. So you, uh, we've got to get, we've got to step back and realize it's they do not look at the world like we look at the world. They mm -hmm. have a completely different cultural grid. They do not separate the two. We do, and that's where we keep on failing. So we don't realize when they're saying Allahu Akbar. Why do you think they're saying that? We don't go into battle say God be praised or Jesus is Lord as we go into battle. It would be stupid to do so. And uh, even when the Crusaders took the flag and had and had the cross above it, one of the biggest recriminations that has come since that time is why in the world did they go in the bat under the, the mm -hmm. side of the cross when Christ said, do not use the sword? So that, there's a contradiction there. You don't go into battle with the cross. Christ would never allow us to do that. There's no example of that. He wouldn't even allow his disciples to defend him. And that's the beauty of the person of Jesus Christ. He would never allow us to use weapons of this world to fight his battle. But look what he says in Romans 13. He told us to obey the governments. So here he is. He sets up governments. So we are to be under the authority of the governments. And this is where Alan and I disagree. But I agree, really believe that there, there are two different entities. That which you give to Caesar, that's the government. That's They are to go to war. They We have to support their decisions, right or bad. But they do go to war. That's their remit. That's their obligation. The church, on the other hand, does not go to war. And that's why I'm a pacifist. And I come from a strong tradition of being pacifist in the Mennonite church. So we are very clear, at least we, those of us who are, are follow the Bible and those of us who go to the scriptures, we are very clear that we are not, we must not use violence for the kingdom of God. But I'm sure, Islam uh, brings the two together. Sure. But Jay, I'm not sure we do disagree on that. I mean, I, I don't think I don't think we can ever go to war in the name of Christ. I, I don't think so at all. I do believe that the, authority, the authorities have to, and I I personally could go to to war, but I wouldn't do it in the name of Christ. I do it in the name of Queen and country if I think it's the there right thing to do. Uh, but I would never do it in the name of Christ. Um, although as a Christian, I feel I could go to war, and we would disagree because I'm not a pacifist like you. Can I just come back to something that Peter raised a moment ago? This thing about the, the if, if these people like the, 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 these attacks in France, indeed, are all over the place, and the um, the media will quite and politicians will also often say, well, they had mental issues, uh, so uh, they, they, something wrong with them mentally, and so on. And I remember, and you will remember this, Jay, some years ago. Um, there was a, a really nice middle class Methodist who um, came, I think, from East Anglia, and a nice, gentle sort of guy, but then converted. Uh, to Islam and made a great song and dance about it, and then he was he 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 was then he wrote a lot. He was, I think he still sometimes goes to the corner. He certainly went to the corner uh, in in the days when you were there and and I came down, 
and he wrote blogs uh, a lot. And he, he wrote a blog, a series of blogs, I believe, if I remember rightly, about um, when is it right for apostates to be beheaded or words to that effect. And I, I, I was absolutely aghast. The, and I, I just accused him of a moral collapse since he converted to Islam. That nice, gentle Methodist from East Anglia, middle-class Methodist, would never think it's ever right to kill somebody because of they changed their, their views or whatever. And suddenly he converts to Islam and he's salivating over writing this blog about when is it right to kill somebody for, for, for because they've apostatized. And it's this mental and moral collapse, at least in this case, um, that... that that, that is, is astonishing, absolutely astonishing. It was astonishing. And I wonder if that's an element to it as well. It's not a, um, yeah, it's, it's the collapse inside of any sort of mor morality as we, you and I would understand it and replaced by the, the, well, the injunction from the Quran, I suppose. Is that, is that Paul Williams you're referring to? Uh, if you want to say the name, yes. <laughs> so, okay, uh, I don't mind saying the name. I think he, he needs to be named and shamed. I think it's, he's done a lot of this. He's been doing it even now with Hatun. He's very clear that we that Hatun should be incarcerated, be thrown out of the corner. Uh, so he, he's ongoing. He's, he, there is something that happens. And I, I'm not sure, and I don't want to just uh, pinpoint Paul Williams and just say he's got a problem there. I think this what you're bringing up is something that we have seen quite across the board. There, it, so, Islam has a spirit about it that does change people irrevocably. And I've seen people hold personalities change once they've converted. Mm -hmm. At the same token, I've also seen that Islam, a lot of the converts we get, we used to get at Speaker's Corner, tended to come from pa Catholic backgrounds, who, and they tend to be Catholics who were angry with the church. There was an anger there to begin with, and it seemed to be a very attractive, Islam seemed to be very attractive to them, because they could then play out their anger. And many of them were, had real, had some real difficulties in their past, in their, uh, uh, because and then when more than I pushed in them, the more they angry they got. But uh, with Paul Williams, he's an interesting because he de he's full of this contradiction. You're right, he is, and I think the dif the difficulty for an awful lot of uh, in, 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 going the other token, just look and ask, and, and uh, both you and Peter and Alan can think of a lot of Muslims that have become Christians. And when you look and see how there has been a complete temperament and a complete character change within their lives since they've become a Christian. And what's fascinating, you see the other direction. You see it come just the opposite, where they were angry, where they were uh, they were depressed, where they had an enormous amount of uh, psychological difficulties. Once they became a Christian and gave their life to Jesus Christ, a lot of that just went by the wayside. Not always as fast as we like to see it happen. And so there are still interesting, uh, almost cases, point by point, back and forth. But getting back to this idea, are, most, are these radicals, especially these young guys, these lone wolves, as they call them, are they social misfits? I, I got to know quite a few of these lone wolves. I got to know them because I was close friends mm -hmm. with Sheikh Omar Bakri Muhammad. I was close friends with Anjum Chowdhury, who were both heads of uh, leaders and still are the leaders of the Mahajudin party. It's now has a different name. I think it's uh, Islam for UK. They keep on changing their name because they keep on getting arrested and made illegal. And so they would change their name and come up with a brand new name, but they would keep the same phone numbers. So you always knew that that was the same group. <laughs> and that's how you got in contact with them. But Anjum Chowdhury and, and uh, Sheikh Umar Bakri Muhammad were some of the most, I mean, if you, you once you get to know them, they're, they're brilliant guys. They're decent fellows. Uh, I find, and I know that this is hard for some people to hear because you, they think like six demons on, uh, because the press has demonized them so heavily uh, that they come across as demons. They're not demons in real life. They're not social misfits at all. And I find that they were quite strongly imbued with scripture. They always were able to go back and support. One of the things I was always impressed with Sheikh Omar Bakri Muhammad, in fact, the one, the first debate I did with him in 1999, look how many years ago, we're talking about 21 years ago, my first debate with him. He got up there and he just went right through one reference after another scripture showing what Islam would look like when it was the story that the debate was on What's wrong with the Khilafah? Why is it you don't like the Khilafah? The Khilafah versus the kingdom of God. And he just went scripture, scripture after scripture. He always supported what he said in scripture. And I was, I was amazed at his grasp of scripture and his grasp of theology and his understanding of legal code. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you can't get if you're a social misfit. I mean, someone of the, uh, probably mm -hmm. one of the greatest names in the 20th century, uh, Said Qutb, Said Qutb is well known as the as the king of radicalism he is the one that came, that, that wrote the mein Kampf of radicalism uh in in the shade of, in the shadow of, in the shade of uh, uh the, of the quran in the shade of the quran in the shadow of the quran uh that he wrote milestones is another book he wrote while he was in prison there in egypt and here is a prodigy this guy had memorized the quran by the time he was 10 years old that's the size of our new testament you're saying that this guy was had 
what had mental problems and this is the thing this is the narrative alan uh, that you're hearing in your press your press has to come up with some type of response to why these young wolves these lone wolves are doing what they're doing look at jihadi john remember jihadi john mm -hmm. he came from london mm -hmm. where did he go to school saint john's there in uh, central london so he went to one of the best schools in britain he was he came from a very wealthy family a very wealthy muslim family he had everything given to him he had an entire future ahead of him. And yet here he was there in Syria, slitting the throats uh, on camera and reciting. And look, whenever he slit their throats, don't please don't, don't go back to the videos. But what was he quoting when he was slitting their throats? Surah 47, Ayah 4, 5 and 6, about the beheadings. So these, uh, these are not social misfits. They are not delinquents. They are not people who have an anger issue. Some of them may have had an anger issue. I would suggest that's yes, true. Uh, but a lot, lot of the ones that I've seen who are at the forefront of the, the debate that's going on, I'm not talking about the converts now, not the Western converts. I'm talking about those who come from Islamic families and who then join ISIS and who have uh, some of the biggest names in the ISIS uh, enclave. And there's what, over 2,000 that join ISIS from uh, Britain alone. Take a look and see if they are all misfits. 2,000 of them? Uh, what are now? What is up to now? 22,000 that are now on the list with with your police there as people who are supporters of ISIS, and those are just the ones that your police know about? Are you saying they're all social misfits? Are you saying that these people are all delinquents? Are you saying that they have, are, are mentally deficient? Not the ones that I got to know, and I got to know them, and we used to see them, and we used to engage with them. And if you see a lot of them who come down to Speaker's Corner, they're eloquent, they're absolutely able, and they absolutely believe, they are as fervent in their belief as I am in mine. And what really motivates them is this book. What really motivates him is this man, the book of the man, the book of the man, the book of the man. You're looking at him right here. The book is the Quran. The man is Muhammad. And that's why we have to completely, we, we're going to have to change our narrative. And that's why Hattun gets it so well. I don't know if you're going to talk about Hattun today, but so, we need to get onto her. She let, does get it better than anybody else. Let, let's get on to Jay. But just before we do, can I just point out to our viewers that they can get a lot more of you? on Fander Films, P-F-A-N-D-E-R Films, and you normally put, what, two or three videos up a week on a range of topics. So I'd certainly encourage our viewers to to go, and this is a, a huge topic, the issue of Islam and the clash <clears throat> between cultures and, and different ways of, of seeing the world, different worldviews. So I'd encourage our viewers to go and go onto your YouTube channel, Fander Films, and a lot of the information is there. So they can. it's the best way to educate your stuff there's a lot written there are a lot of materials available but obviously watching a video is a very easy way of consuming this and understanding so um yeah i'd encourage our viewers yeah. to go when you finish here after you subscribe to hard to vote after you click on that subscription button and um, do have a look at founder films and there's a lot of material there but on hutton so um obviously i was there on sunday uh to see hutton uh last week she had been uh, attacked by a man who came over and punched her because obviously she was, uh, I think she was holding up some of the cartoons, Charlie Hebdo cartoons, I think, and um, that got someone, uh, a Muslim, extremely angry and they went over and punched her. Interesting to see the media say talk about an alleged attack. I mean, it's their own video, but our media don't want to even uh, engage and agree and say, because if they do say it was an attack by a Muslim on a Christian, then actually they have to say, why is there an attack? And that why question is very dangerous. But Hatun is, uh, yeah, she's there five foot two or whatever and takes on anyone extremely brave. Did you want to, obviously, um, she has taken on your, your mantle in Speaker's Corner um, mm -hmm. and she is a very brave individual, obviously a, a convert as well. Do you want to talk about her ministry and why what she does is so important? Yeah, I don't know how to explain or describe Hatun. She is totally <laughs> unique. I've never met anybody, small little girl, and yet she's completely defenseless. And yet she just continues week after week holding up those cartoons. And she's doing two things simultaneously because there are two discussions happening simultaneously that are unique to Speaker's Corner and can only be done at Speaker's Corner. What she's doing at Speaker's Corner, we can't do anywhere else. We can't do this on university campuses, as I said earlier. We can't do this on the streets, at book tables. We can't. We can do it on the internet, and that's about it. But as far as engaging Muslims face to face with these two icons, notice they're both icons that she holds up. So she holds up a Quran, like this one here. She would hold up one of these larger Qurans, 
by the way, these are the problem right here. These are the this is what she actually introduced to the world. These are called kidats. These are different Qurans. This is a uh, Ibn Amir's Quran. This is one of the Qurans that has been around since 736. This is a Quran uh, that was the first one that was introduced. Uh, here's another one. This is a Warsh Quran. Um, let me get it right side up. And these Qurans, uh, I've got about 10 of them that I have now got off the internet. Every one of them is in Arabic. There's There you can see the Arabic there. And every one of them is different not two or not the two are the same these are arabic Qurans. they're all the, they're all different and they've been around since the 8th century since 736 836 uh, 738 sorry 740 770 up until 905 so you're getting up to the 10th century now this I, I, we held these Qurans, not these the ones she had she had 26 of them there are 30 official ones that now exist in the world today we held up 26 of these back in 2016 Hatun was the one that found these and went all over the Muslim Arab speaking world and got collected them and holding them up in public was the first time that had ever been done. And that caused a huge fury, enormous backlash against Muslims there at Speaker's Corner. So it was introduced at Speaker's Corner four years ago. There was a man in the audience named Muhammad Hijab, very well known in the Muslim world. Now, those Muslims who are watching, he stands about six foot six and he has a following, I think, of about 370,000 on YouTube. Uh, he was in the he was in the audience that day and saw what we were doing and had all the Muslims leave. He called them away. That's all on video on Fander Films. You can see what happened. And he did said, do not look at what they're showing you and don't listen to what they were saying. But he never responds for these Muslims that he called out. So back in June of this year, we're talking about five months ago, there was an interview between Muhammad Hijab and Dr. Yasser Qadi, uh, the world leading authority on the Quran here in the United States, got his doctorate on the Quran at Yale University in 1995. So we're, we're talking about 25 years ago. And he asked him this question, which Quran is the authoritative Quran? Which is the Quran that's in heaven? Which is the Quran that was revealed <laughs> to Muhammad? Which is the Quran that Uthman wrote? Is it the Qawarish? Is it the Kalun? Is it the Ibn Kathir? Is it the Kasai? Is it the Hafs? And he, you know, he could have named 30 of them right there. And before he could even stop, before he could go any further, Yasser Qadi says, do not ask me this question. We don't talk about this in public. This is something we do not talk about in public. And so as a result of that, there was a, there was a you can see there was a, there was a, his body language was absolutely full of, I mean, I, didn't, I, I was sitting there and I was just clapping. I was so, I couldn't believe that he was being so, so uh, visual in front of the camera. It took him 25 minutes, months, uh, Mohammed, of insisting that he'd give him a response to it. Yasser Qadi says, we have a red line. We have a respect for the Quran. And we only go to this red line. We don't go beyond this line. We don't ask certain questions of the Quran. But at Yale University, there are no red lines. You can ask any question you want. And he had a crisis of knowledge. He kept on insisting, not faith, but knowledge. And this was the problem 25 years ago that Muhammad Hijab was bringing up. And finally, at the end of 25 minutes, after insisting a second time uh, by Muhammad Hijab, which are you going to write on that blank sheet of paper? He said, they're all the Quran. They're all the Quran. Now, remember, people don't know this, but Hatu Tash and her team in London have now found 93,000 differences in those Qurans that she's looked at. Wow. That's not herself. Yeah. She doesn't speak Arabic. Her team has found 93,000 different words, different letters. Every Muslim all over the world knows that there's not one word, not one letter that is different between any of these Qurans. And yet her team has already found 93,000 differences. Our team, a team in Australia, Benny, uh, uh, Dr. Bernie Power, has just these two Qurans here. This is the Warsh, this is the Hafs, the two most popular Qurans in the world today. This is known, all, this is used all over North Africa. This is used the rest of the world. 5,000 differences between these two Qurans. So what does Hatun Tash do? She takes the Quran down to speaker's corner, drills holes in it and holds them up. Because in the middle of that interview, Yasir Qadi says, we in Islam have holes in our narrative. There it is. We have holes in our narrative. And the Western world is looking at us as if the emperor with no clothes. <laughs> mm. I mean, I couldn't have written the script better. I, if I had written it for him, that holds in the narrative has now become the, the signature piece for that argument, holds in the narrative. Well, what better way to show holds in the narrative than to drill holes in the Quran, which Hatu Tosh has done. So she has taken that Quran to speaker's corner with holes drilled in it 
saying, you've got holes in your narrative. We've been training you. We've been saying this. We've been telling you this for four years. There is the symbol of holes in a narrative, all right? there. It's, it's what you always do. You get something to symbolize your discussion. All you need to do is hold it up. You don't even have to say anything anymore. The Muslims see that. They know we don't have an answer for this. And she says, what are you going to do about these holes? What are you going to do about these holes? And she just points to them. That shuts down that debate. And they keep on changing the subject. You get that on camera. That goes up onto the internet. And you're getting hundreds of Muslims that are leaving Islam mm-hmm. because of these holes in the narrative in just the last five months. Meanwhile, simultaneously, the Charlie Hebdo cartoons come uh, um, uh, they come to court. And so the Charlie Hebdo cartoons come to court. So she starts holding up the Charlie Hebdo cartoons. Hmm. Again, the Charlie Hebdo cartoons become the symbol of that debate. And that debate is not a theological debate. That is a freedom of speech debate. And what better place to do that than in Speaker's Corner, the center of bastion of freedom of speech worldwide. There's no other place on earth where you can say anything you want except Speaker's Corner. That's why she's holding up that one alongside the Quran. So she's holding up both the Charlie Hebdo as the symbol of freedom of speech and the holes in the Quran as the symbol of this holes in the narrative debate. Now, that's to me, that's the best thing she should do. That's exactly what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to do, get it so it's capsulized by one symbol so the whole world can see it. And you do it at the one place all the world can see it because at Speaker's Corner, you then film it and get it up onto the internet, get it up onto DCCI, which is her YouTube channel. If you could just advertise mm-hmm. that one too. Defending Christ, yeah. Critiquing Islam, DCCI. Now that's beca- for that reason, about six weeks ago, about 200 Muslims showed up at Speaker's Corner. I understand they mostly came from Birmingham. And they waited for the police to come. They were not mm. saying much. You can see the whole film. They didn't say much. There was maybe about 12. Oh, Jay's frozen. Yeah, He'll come back in a minute. I think we were losing him before, weren't we? Oh, um, oh, he's in full flow. Um, we'll, we'll see if he comes back. But yeah, DC, uh, DCCI Ministries, I'd encourage our viewers to go. It's fantastic. And um, I saw a video that Hudson put out yesterday talking about Speaker's Corner and um, and how appreciative she was of those bringing flowers, chocolates. Um, I know that uh, Derek, uh, dressed in his Union Jack suit, uh, gave her flowers and chocolates uh, from Hearts of Oak, and he actually had a card with Hearts of Oak printed on it. So it was a, a very nice gesture. Um, I did it on behalf. So it, it, you may not know it, but you give Hatton a card. <laughs> So from Hearts of Oak, uh, and it was via Derek. Um, but it was in, yeah, the, the video is up there. So I do encourage you to look at that video and see Hatton in action, as well as uh, Tommy arriving and meeting her and Tommy being arrested. So there are two sides of there's Hatton in action debating, but there's also Tommy and the work uh, and, and appearing there and being arrested. Um, we'll give we'll give Jay a minute or two to see if he comes back, although we are coming near an end. Um, we'll give you an update just as as we give Jay a minute or two to come back. On Thursday, we have Anne-Marie Waters. Uh, she'll be with us on live stream. She's been with us before. She's coming talking about the For Britain conference coming up. And uh, she is going to be speaking at our conference on the 28th of November. Virtual conference, of course. We're not allowed to leave our houses. So all online. Uh, we have two confirmed guests. We put out an email today. If you haven't got the email, do click on that connect button on the website. But Anne-Marie Waters, leader of For Britain, uh, will be giving a talk at our conference. And Tommy. Tommy Robbins will also be giving a talk. We will announce other names as the week goes on on Parlor VK, Twitter. So make sure and you're following those, you can see those names coming up. And we will put out a link over the weekend for you to click and register an interest. Um, and then we will see um, how many we have and to do that. We haven't done a virtual conference before. Uh, we'll probably, we know what format we're going to do. We know what platform. So uh, yes, we'll put all that information out over the weekend on Parlor, uh, on VK, on Twitter. Jay's back. We'll bring him back so he can finish off. Jay, we lost you in your back. Yeah, I, I'm sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened. My computer just went out on me, and I've had to change computers. So can you, you hear you me were, now? You're, yeah, you're in, yes, you're in full flow. Um, it's our last couple of minutes. We're 55 minutes in, but you were obviously talking about uh, the work that Hatton does. I, I'm quite surprised that someone holding up a crown with holes in it 
It's not something I would feel comfortable doing. Um, it obviously puts your life in danger, and I assume it puts her life in danger doing something like that. Yeah, it does put her life in danger. And to be fair, what happened two weeks ago where she got hit, that's the first time that's ever been done on camera. She mm. has never been hit at Speaker's Corner that I'm aware of in the last eight years that we and I, she and I, and uh, she has been there by herself. So that's why it caused such a furore. What people yeah. don't know is that she's getting beat up away from the camera quite often. And she okay. is all, she's getting beat up, especially on trains, by Muslims mm. who recognize her. So she is mm. getting beat up. Uh, back in 2016, when I was there, uh, she got her foot broken. She had her ribs broken. They tried to hang her. She was on. She had to wear a neck brace for about for about three months on the ladder with me for, from 2016. So she is, they're attacking her more than anybody else for two reasons. One is she was the one that really started this whole debate on the uh, holes in the Quran narrative. She is the one that they're blaming for. Rightly so. She is the one who introduced it to the world. And mm. she is the only one in Britain that I know that is actually going public with the Charlie Hebdo and forcing the issue and forcing the say, you've got to deal, you've got to listen to criticism. You, If you can't listen to criticism at Speaker's Corner, and if she cannot be protected at Speaker's Corner by the police, then we've lost the battle because the mm. police have to make sure they protect her there. And because that is the only place where we can say this, where she can do this. And just as France is now coming down and actually uh, shutting down uh, the Muslims from uh, from uh, con confronting this notion, we need to also make sure that they're there in Britain, that she is protected so she has the freedom to at least give, not only talk about the Quran, but also the freedom of speech to even talk about mocking Muhammad. If we, if if need be, I wouldn't do it. You won't do it. But she does. Jay, um, you're, you're, what you're really saying is there's a, a, a real chance that she could uh, she could be martyred. She could die at Speaker's Corner or related to her her, her work at Speaker's Corner. Yet presumably you wouldn't um, you wouldn't advise her to stop doing it. Why is that? Alan, back in 2016, when she got beat up really bad, when she had got was hanged and had her bones broken, uh, she came to the corner that Sunday having this hat this just happened on the thursday so three days wow. later she came to the corner and she was sweating profusely she had a high fever she should have been in the hospital and i said you get right back to the hospital she would not go back to the hospital and i said you know they're going to kill you she said well it's all your fault i said what do you mean it's my fault she said you told me to read chapters 17 18 and 19 of the book of acts uh, to follow what paul did in when he went to Cabria, cappadocia laodicea there in ephesus and everywhere he went he got beat up he got thrown into prison twice they stoned him almost to death uh, he caused a riot in ephesus and he was finally killed in rome she says you the one that told me to read that and that's exactly what we're supposed to do and remember you were the one that told me to read matthew 10 where jesus said i'm sending you out as lamb before wolves you're going to be hated for my name you're going to be persecuted for my name you are are going to be jailed and you're going to be flogged for my name and you're going to be killed those are the five things that jesus was promising in fact was commissioning the 12 with she said that is their commissioning that's my commissioning so of course i expect to be beat up of course i expect to be killed if need be this is what christ calls of us if we are going to be preaching his name in public so her response would be the same then in 2016 as it is today and even when i talked to her last week she has not changed her response and i think that's response for all of us this is not not something that she will shirk away from or walk away from. Uh, this is not something that she would want to walk away from because it is something that Paul, listen, all the disciples were, except for John, every one of the disciples was killed for the gospel. So why should it be any different for us in the 21st century if that was the norm in the first century? Powerful, powerful stuff. Indeed. Jay, we could go on for a long time. It is, it is fascinating and it is a huge subject, a subject which many people know very little about um and the work that you're doing in fander films that hatun is doing in dcci is invaluable to educating the public because they certainly do not get any of this education on the normal media channels so it, it is fascinating so thank you jay once again for joining us and giving us your time no thank you jay thank you very much indeed god bless you both thank you um, and stay, stay with us as we finish, Jay. We can catch up just after. We always do this. We or, or sometimes our guests leave just as we finish off with our viewers. So hang along, for, hang on for a minute. Um, we, we tell so we're telling our viewers about uh, the conference coming up. So that's twentieth of twentieth uh, of November. 
nearly Christmas time, goodness. Um, so I'll be virtual, put out the details over the weekend. Um, I'll say Anne-Marie and Tommy are both speaking. We'll have a number of other speakers. And the topic is Jackboot Britain in the lockdown and the implications that has on us all with all our freedoms taken away. And I desperately need my hair cut. I think I have until Sunday or no, I have until Wednesday midnight to get a cut. So I think I'll go and join a, a long queue in some barber nearby. Um, we have Anne-Marie with us on Thursday and we have uh, Terry Giles with us again on Monday. And he will be giving us an overview on U.S. elections. I hope you voted, Jay. Not till tomorrow. Okay. Uh, I'll not ask you who, because that's a very private matter. You can go in. It's very strange in America. I'm a conservative. Uh, <laughs> I'm a conservative. I, I, I wouldn't know. But, it, Jay, it's interesting in America. They can vote early, very early. They can vote weeks before, which is quite different here in the U.K., where you vote on the day or you have a booth of ballot. Yeah, this is called COVID. It's it's only for COVID reasons, and and I understand almost sixty percent. I'm sorry, forty percent of all those el eligible have already voted. So mm. it's already in the bag. Who for which side? We don't know. We won't know. We may not even know for weeks. <laughs> Exciting times, Jay. It is. I, I, everybody, but you know, for for both of you, you're going to remember this year because of pandemic. You're going to remember this year because of the election. I'm going to remember 2020 because of all this new material that we're getting on the Quran. We're destroying the Quran in 2020. We have never seen Muhammad in the Quran this week. And everything I use is historical criticism. That's some of we haven't talked about. That's for another time. That's for another. That's for another episode. We'll have you Jay, back. We, we, we will gladly have you on to unpack more of that. Absolutely, uh, another time as we get closer to Christmas and we're continually locked down. Jay, thank you. It's it's a pleasure as always. Thank you. Thank you Jay. Um, thank and you. thank you to and just uh, l we've put a lot of videos up recently. So we had the Tommy interview on Tuesday. We had outside the French Embassy on Friday. We had Speaker's Corner on Sunday. So, I mean, you've asked us to do more of those getting out on location, uh, recording what's happening. So uh, you liked, obviously, the, the one on the French Embassy and the one on Sunday at Speaker's Corner. So try and do more of those and bring them to you. So do give us your feedback on info at heartsfolk.org. It'd be great to hear your thoughts on those and any suggestions of what we should cover. We'll definitely take those thoughts on board. So thank you very much to our viewers and have a good rest of your evening and a good rest of the week. Make sure and get out before lockdown hits you on Thursday. So thank you and we'll see you again on Thursday. <laughs>